Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to Chapter 6, uh, Part 2. We're going to talk about exocrine glands, and then we'll talk a little bit about some clinical um, integumentary issues, and then we'll close talking about developmental and tissue repair. We'll start with the exocrine glands and tell you that they come in two different forms, right? So exocrine means we're going to release something outside of the body, right? So we have sweat glands and then we have sebaceous glands. Sweat glands produce a watery substance and sebaceous glands produce an oily substance. Now we're talking about the two different types of sweat glands. We have merocrine and apocrine sweat glands. A little more detail here about merocrine sweat glands. So remember, this is one type of eccrine gland. So the merocrine sweat gland is really um, widely distributed. They say there's three to four million of these sweat glands all over the entire body. Um, they're simple. They're coiled. They're going to produce sweat by exocytosis. See, we did have to learn some of these things for a reason, right? And sweat is mostly water. Remember, we're going to do thermoregulation, right? We're going to take that water on the surface of our skin. It's going to evaporate, and it's going to pull heat away from the body. But there are some other chemicals. Remember, there's some waste product. There's some breakdown uh, intermediate chemical structures from metabolism. And then we have some electrolytes. So you might have some salt, right? So electrolytes, ions, kind of the same thing. So the second type of exocrine gland we're going to talk about is the apocrine sweat gland. These are coiled tubes just like the merocrine except for these secretions get dumped into hair follicles. So apocrine sweat glands are located in areas where you have a secondary kind of pubic hair development. So these start producing secretions during puberty. You're going to find apocrine sweat glands in the armpit area, axillary, right, around the nipples, and in the pubic and anal regions or anogenital regions. So some people say this is what makes you smell like an ape, right, ape-like smell. So what happens, this secretion is a little bit more than water. There's some proteins in there, there's some fats, some lipids in there, and when these secretions sit on your skin, we also have bacteria on our skin. And the bacteria goes, oh yummy, these things are great, we're going to start metabolizing them. And so the waste from the bacteria metabolizing the proteins in the lipid is what makes you smelly. Let's look at these sweat glands in the picture. Here's the merocrine sweat gland. You can see it's a coiled structure and it goes all the way to the surface and then releases that watery substance onto the surface of the skin. So this aids in thermoregulation. And then down here we see the apocrine sweat gland. So here's the apocrine sweat gland. This develops during puberty and it kind of hijacks or dumps into the hair follicle. So instead of going to the top, it goes over here to the hair follicle, mixes with the hair follicle secretions, and then comes out. So remember this is more of a lipid, uh, protein, kind of a thicker, sticky uh, secretion. When this lands on the skin, remember we have bacteria on the skin. Right. So that bacteria starts breaking down those secretions, and this is what make, gives us our body odor. You can also think this is what makes um, certain items smell better on one individual. If you've ever smelled perfume on somebody or a cologne on someone, and you say, wow, that smells really good, and then when you put it on you, it doesn't smell the same. So they think that the apocrine sweat gland mixing with the hair follicle secretions kind of gives you a unique um, odor, right? Maybe if you've ever smelled your child and you know what your child smells like. So they think these apocrine glands are responsible for uh, pheromones, if you've heard of that term before. Second category we have to look at is sebaceous glands. And sebaceous glands release by this holocrine method. So remember, holocrine is where the whole cell ruptures and releases its contents. It doesn't just do a watery substance via exocytosis into a tube. The entire cell bursts and all the cell parts inside break down and are part of the secretion. So we call this sebum. It's a lubricant for skin or hair. It's more waxy-like. 
It's probably the best way to explain it. And there is some bacterial uh, killing chemicals that are produced by the sebaceous gland. It discharges into the hair follicle, and these secretions are controlled by hormones, specifically androgens. So this would be testosterone, and then also can be converted into estrogen. And these are really active during puberty. So this is why some people can have severe acne that's related to puberty and hormones. We need to just briefly mention these last two types of exocrine glands, seromous glands and mammary glands. We focus on sweat glands and oil glands or spacious glands, but we do need to, to look at these. So seruminous glands are only in the external ear canal and they create earwax to stop anything, any foreign material from making it uh, through your ear canal to your brain. And then we have mammary glands. Again, both of these are modified apocrine sweat glands. They function only in pregnancy and lactating females, and they're going to produce milk. And we'll talk more about how that mechanism gets turned on when we get to the second half of anatomy and reproduction. The same image that we saw earlier, but now we can focus on the sebaceous glands. And remember that these cells are going to rupture. They're going to dump their contents into the hair follicle, and that's going to help lubricate the hair and keep it from becoming brittle and dry and breaking. So sebaceous glands here. And then they also, I know we just talked about these, but they also show you apocrine. They're putting everything together because they're trying to save, I guess, room. But remember, apocrine are only in axillary... Uh -huh, nipple, and I'm going to say urogenital just to save room. So how do I word this? You have sebaceous glands that don't have apocrine glands next to them, right? So where would you have sebaceous glands anywhere that there's hair? So if you have hair, you have a sebaceous gland. So think um, your forearms, you have hair, right? On the top of your head, you have hair, your scalp. But these are the only areas that you have apocrine sweat glands mixing with the sebaceous secretions. I talked about acne in one of the previous slides. Um, here it says plugged sebaceous ducts. So remember we had the sebaceous gland and it's dumping into the hair follicle, right? So this duct could get plugged, and then this becomes inflamed. And that could be plugged with bacteria or with um, some of the protein, lipid, you know, kind of waxy, the cells that are being broken down. But there's also, uh, remember, these are controlled by uh, some hormone activity as well. So you could have an increase in hormones that are telling these cells to grow and then that can cause an enlargement. So usually if it's hormone related, um, you'll see it called cystic acne. Um, and if it's just a plugged sebaceous gland, this could be treated pretty easily with salicylic acid, right, benzoyl peroxides. If it's this cystic acne that's caused by hormones, you usually have to take some sort of drug. Um, you might have heard of Accutane, and Accutane actually depresses um, sebaceous gland activity. But you have to be careful. Um, it's not good liver, kidneys, um, so they usually have to do testing periodically to make sure that you're not burning out those uh, vital organs for getting rid of toxins. Um, but it will actually cause your sebaceous glands to shrink in structure. And, and hopefully you won't have this cystic acne because even though you have hormones being released, you decrease the amount of sebaceous gland cells, and so they can only copy so many times, right? So you're kind of just depressing that uh, sebaceous gland activity. Make sure you understand the difference between regeneration and fibrosis. Fibrosis is when you develop scar tissue. So collagen is basically going to fill the gap here, and you do not restore the tissue. So it's basically we're just going to stitch you back together. We don't care if you're not functioning. Regeneration, this is when the dead cells are, or damaged cells are replaced or copied with the same cell type, and then you restore the organ or the tissue's function. So everything behaves just like it used to. Here are the stages for wound healing. Um, we can read through these, but I think it's better if we just look at the picture. You can see here that there's some sort of wound. It's filled with blood. So what does that mean? If you cut yourself, if you have a paper cut, 
and it doesn't bleed, that means you just went through the epithelium, right? Because epithelium is avascular. If you have a paper cut and it's bleeding, that means you had to go into the connective tissue layer because that's where the blood vessels are. Remember, connective tissue is vascular, right? So you can see here there's been some sort of cut in the tissue and the blood vessels are damaged and they're leaking blood into the wound. Then eventually a blood clot is going to form and we'll talk more about how that happens when we get to the blood chapter in the second half of anatomy. But you're going to see some macrophages are going to be released. Macrophages are going to try to clean up any debris that's there or any pathogens that are there. And then you're going to have fibroblasts. And remember, fibroblasts make fibers. So they're going to come in and start making fibers. And their goal is to try to stitch you back together, right? Here, you can see that the blood vessels are starting to regrow, and you can see that the fibroblasts are doing their job. They're creating fibers, and they're kind of knitting the, the skin back together. And then here we have the epithelium is going to regenerate. So we've, we've regenerated the fibers in the connective tissue. Now we have to have these epithelial cells regenerate, and then eventually the scab will fall off. Psoriasis is something that we see quite often clinically. Um, it's basically an overgrowth of skin. So rapid overgrowth of new skin cells when your immune cells start attacking the keratinocytes. So that's why it's autoimmune. You're attacking yourself. And chronic is lifelong. It's been happening for a long time. So basically your immune system sees your own skin cells as foreign invaders and it causes this rapid overgrowth of new um, skin cells. And you're going to see kind of this scaly skin on the epidermal surface. It can, it can itch, it can cause pain, it can cause your skin to crack. And there are several different uh, treatments here for psoriasis. Uh, burns is another clinical aspect that we should look at when we talk about integumentary. Uh, burns can be caused by heat, by chemicals, sunlight. I'm sure we've all had a sunburn. Um, you can also have electrical burns. And really what's causing um, or what's threatening your life is the loss of fluid and the increased chance of infections getting into your bloodstream and then traveling anywhere in your body. So we'll look at first degree burns and second degree burns. But the way I look at it is first degree is it only goes through the first layer. And what's the first layer of your integument? It's your epidermis. A second degree burn goes through the second layer. And what's the second layer? That's the dermis. Third degree burns, you've gone through everything. You've gone through the two integument layers and you've gone through the subcutaneous layer. That would be hypodermis, right? So basically, if you have bone showing, this is third degree burn. This requires hospitalization. You're going to be dehydrated, um, susceptible to infection. You're going to have to take in a lot of calories to try to heal yourself. You could have scarring. You're probably going to need a skin graft. If I've burnt everything away, right? So here's my skin. I'm going to draw little hairs on it, right? Here's my epidermis. Here's my dermis. And then here's my hypodermis. If I've burnt through all of this section here, how can it regrow? If these two areas can't come together, how am I going to fill in this gap and regrow? I'm probably not, right? It's like you have no starting material. So we have to take material from some other part of your body and we have to lay it on top so that there's some starting material for those fibroblasts to copy themselves and start making fibers. There's also something that you can look at called the rule of nines. I'm not going to make you calculate the rule of nines, but I would know the definition. So if they wanted to see how severe the burn was, they would conduct a rule of nines. And it's basically, think about the front part of your arm would be 9% of your body. And the back side of your arm would be 9% of your body. Right? Both arms, 9%, 9%. Then you have your trunk, and this would be... I think it's 18%. And then you have the front side of your leg, back side of your leg, front side of your leg, back side of your leg, or back, back, front, front, whatever. And each one is 9%. So they can look and calculate kind of what's the burn severity and what's kind of the volume of fluid that's been lost. So remember, in those blood vessels, blood vessels, blood is mostly made up of water. And then you had all that ground substance in the background and we have um, 
extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid. Fluid, there we go. That's all water, water based. So you've lost a lot of your water supply um, from your body if you burn through the dermis. As we age, everything stops working as well, right? So you reduce the number and activity of the stem cells that are generating more keratinocytes. The skin repair process slows down. You're going to have thinner skin, um, fewer collagen fibers. Remember, collagen, it can bend and then it can bend back. Well, what happens over time is the collagen bends and then there's no bend back. So this is why we have sagging features as we get older. Elastic fiber loses its elasticity. We have crease lines, uh, especially if you're making that furrowed face all the time, you'll get those lines right in the middle of your forehead. Um, immune response decreases. Again, everything just stops working as well. As we age, our skin uh, continues to change, and we're assaulted by UV radiation from the sun all the time. Right? So even if you step outside for a few minutes, you have some UV radiation. It can damage your DNA. Um, we have repair processes for this, but as you age, that happens less frequently right? or not as well. Um, and this is a predominant factor for skin cancer, and skin cancer is the most common type of cancer. It's also usually the most um, effectively treated if you catch it at an early stage, typically on the head and the neck, the areas that are most exposed to UV radiation, and then if you're fair skinned or lighter skinned, you're at a higher risk. Go look in the book about how we um, kind of identify what could possibly be skin cancer. So there's the ABCD rule. So the diameter, how large is the item, what's uh, the item on the skin, right? The, the, the spot that you see on your skin. What's the diameter? What's the color of it? Um, what does the border look like? So is it irregularly shaped? Like does it have this squiggly kind of, or is it a nice round? Um, color, usually if it's a mix match of color, so if it's multicolored, like pink on one side or red on one side and brown on the other side, that might be something you have to worry about. Uh, diameter, they say bigger than a pencil eraser. And asymmetrical. I'm just going to abbreviate asymmetrical. So this would be asymmetrical, not the same on each side, right? So it's kind of this irregular shape. The border is jagged. The color is a mix match of colors, and it's larger than a pencil eraser. That doesn't mean you have cancer. It just means you really need to go and have that looked at and have a biopsy done and have it tested to see if it is cancerous. Last slide here, um, we'll talk about Botox and wrinkles quickly. It seems to be, uh, you know, something that's still talked about quite frequently. I know people have Botox parties, um, but this is a temporary effect only. Um, it's not like we can reverse aging. We have not figured that out yet. Uh, the wrinkles that are caused, like I said, you have that furrowed brow if you're concentrating on something or if you're just angry all the time. You can take bacterial toxins and you can inject them into the facial muscles and it basically blocks the nerve impulses. So your brain can't tell those facial muscles to contract and it kind of relaxes the area. So you're not eliminating the wrinkles. It's only temporary. Once those muscles regain their function, you're going to see the wrinkles again. So this is only a temporary kind of reversal of aging. So we're finished with Chapter 6. I would do kind of an outline. Again, I know I've said this several times, right? So we have our exocrine glands. And then we know that we have, um, oh, sorry, sweat glands. And then two, we have sebaceous glands. We know that we have two types of sweat glands. We have maracrine and we have apocrine. And then we know we have those two modified apocrine, uh, seruminous and mammary. And then we talked about the sebaceous glands, right? So I would go through and make sure that I can outline it and that I also know methods of secretion. 
So remember that all the sweat glands are going to do maracrine secretion and that the sebaceous glands are going to do holocrine secretion. And then I would go through each and talk about the fluid. What does the fluid look like? What's in the fluid? Hopefully that makes sense and I'll talk to you guys on the next uh, PowerPoint.